Hello, everyone, and welcome to Understanding FDA's Priority Review Voucher System, presented by Roe. I'm Eric Saganowski, editor with Fierce Pharma, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Kelly Roney, Senior Research Scientist with Roe, Sheila Bella Irizari, Integrated Product Development Associate with Roe, and Devin Rosenthal, Research Scientist with Roe. You can read their full bios on the left side of your window. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you'd like to download the slide deck, please click the Files button at the lower left corner of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. We will follow the presentations with a Q&A session. Please submit your questions during or after the presentations by clicking the Q&A button on the lower left corner of your screen. Now let's begin. Devin, please go ahead. Thanks for the introduction and <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Next slide, please. So to start talking about the priority review voucher system, what we're going to do is set a framework for this discussion and talk about what the standard pharma model is for incentivizing drug development. So for a traditional uh, drug within pharma, you look for a disease that has a large population of patients that need some sort of therapy. Next slide, please. You then look for this population of patients to have the ability to pay for the therapy. Next slide. And next slide. And then pharma goes ahead and develops a drug to target this disease affecting this large population of patients. Sorry, we can go back a slide. Pharma develops uh, therapy to, to uh, target the disease affecting this large population of patients with the ultimate result of profit for the pharmaceutical company. And so this is just a high-level overview of what the traditional incentive model looks like and what some of the variables impacting that are. If we go to the next slide, we can take a look at non-standard cases. And so in particular and relevant to this conversation will be rare diseases and tropical diseases. If we go to the next slide, you can see if we use the same variables in these equations for rare disease, first off, what shifts is the patient population size. You're dealing with a much smaller number of potential patients who still have the ability to pay, and so uh, a therapy could be generated for them. If we go to the next slide and take a look at tropical diseases, you see the balance here shifts where you have a much larger population of patients. These are uh, typically more global diseases. However, there's not the same potential for reimbursement or payment from these patients for therapies that are developed. Next slide. Consequently, based on these shifts in these variables, there's a much smaller potential profit at the end of the line for pharmaceutical companies. Next slide. Which, just from a purely business standpoint, often uh, it's not a strong incentive for companies to develop therapies in these spaces, despite what need there might actually be uh, you know, for these patient populations. Next slide. And so the question then is how can this process of drug development actually be incentivized in a way that makes sense from a business standpoint for these pharmaceutical companies to move ahead? Next slide. And this is where we get into discussion of the priority review voucher system. Next slide. So here I'm going to give a high-level overview of how priority review vouchers incentivize the drug development process, and we'll go into some more detail about all the various aspects and regulations around all of this in subsequent slides. But from a high-level view, if you have a biotech company or a pharma company and you're developing a therapy for either uh, a qualifying tropical disease or a rare pediatric disease, and you carry that drug through to approval, NDA or BLA approval, you are eligible to receive one of these priority review vouchers. Next slide. These review vouchers incentivize this process in essentially two different ways. The first way is that your company can actually use this priority review voucher for other therapies you're developing, not just tropical disease or rare pediatric disease targeting therapies. If I could get the next slide, please. But any uh, therapy in your pipeline. And this provides priority review, so it shortens the NDA or BLA review time, uh, giving you a competitive advantage in terms of getting to market quicker. Next slide. The other mechanism is something that's unique to the voucher system and uh, a more common topic of conversation when you hear about this, uh, the priority review voucher system. And this is that the vouchers can actually be sold to another company. 
So your company develops a therapy for one of these rare neglected diseases. You can then sell this for some level of profit to another company, and the proceeds from that sale return to your company to help fuel additional development uh, of other therapies. And so a quick anecdote about this. This is, it obviously provides a nice windfall at the end of the path uh, you know, for your company that's developing this therapy. This also has upstream benefits as companies are looking to fundraise early on in development. And so I can tell a specific example of being at a conference a number of months ago and seeing a CEO pitch to a group of investors. And the CEO was uh, CEO of a company that was developing a disease, uh, therapy targeting a very rare pediatric disease. I want to say a uh, total patient population of about 10 patients globally. And I was very interested to see how this would go because you have this room of investors. They're used to seeing these presentations about much larger populations, much larger potential payments and uh, uh, reimbursement potential for a drug. And they're all nodding along. And when somebody asks, how are you going to make money off of this? And the CEO says, well, we're going to be eligible for one of these priority review vouchers. I turned and looked at the room and saw all these investors nod their heads along presentation went along, and this generated a lot of interest. And so it's not just the windfall at the end of the road, it's the incentive that it provides upstream as well in order to help develop these therapies for uh, diseases that may otherwise not have companies focusing on them. Next slide, please. And so if we take a look, you can see that the sale process actually works in the real world. There's been four vouchers sold to date that there's publicly available sale information about. And you can see this has been an increasing uh, sale price process. So the initial voucher sold for somewhere around 60 to $70 million, and the most recently reported sale was up around $350 million. And remember, this is money that's going back into the pockets of these companies to help fuel this drug development process. Next slide. I'll now turn this over to Kelly, who's going to talk in some more detail about the priority review vouchers themselves. Next slide, please. Priority review vouchers are vouchers that have the potential to reduce approval time for a drug. Um, these vouchers reduce review time of a marketing application um, by FDA from 10 months, which is the standard review time, to potentially six months, which is the priority review time. You will often hear this voucher um, in, in the literature and out and about referred to as the golden ticket or the prize. It is granted at marketing approval um, and is an incentive for companies to produce drugs for neglected tropical diseases and rare pediatric diseases. The voucher can then be used for priority review of any subsequent application. Um, together, this may mean faster access to treatment for patients, as well as the potential for more profit for a drug company. Next slide. The priority review voucher idea was first proposed from David Ridley, Henry Grabowski, and Jeffrey Moe at Duke University in their 2006 paper, Developing Drugs for Developing Countries. And the idea in this paper is that you could link drugs for diseases that disproportionately affect developing countries or underprivileged companies with blockbuster drugs, which are more um, typically found in the United States. This um, incentive comes at a fairly low cost to taxpayers. Next slide. This idea was enacted under FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act of 2007, specifically for the development of products for neglected tropical diseases. Next slide. To be eligible for priority review voucher, a drug or vaccine that qualifies must um, be part of an NDA for a new molecular entity or an original biologic. It must merit priority review on its own in order to qualify for the voucher. It must treat a qualifying disease, and the voucher must be used on a 505V1 or PHS351, so drug or biologic application. Next slide. There are two types of FDA priority review vouchers. The first is the Tropical Disease Priority Review Voucher. 
The second is the Rare Pediatric Disease Priority Review Voucher. Next slide. The first, the Tropical Disease Voucher, um, again, was approved in 2007 as part of FIDA, and FIDA authorized FDA to award priority review vouchers to sponsors of marketing applications of new drugs and biologics intended to treat certain tropical diseases. There is a guidance that um, covers the tropical disease from FDA in 2016. Next slide. What you see here are the list of uh, currently qualifying diseases that qualify for a priority review voucher as it exists currently. Those in black were part of the original, and those in blue have been added at a later date. Um, and as you can see, many of these diseases are present in developing countries in greater numbers, such as tuberculosis, malaria, or cholera. Next slide. The tropical diseases in this program uh, tend to be rare in the United States, yet can affect millions of people throughout the world. And again, many are found in under-resourced countries. And so the goal of this program was to encourage development of new and innovative therapies for these tropical diseases. Next slide. So how does a company obtain a tropical disease priority review voucher? Um, first, you need to develop a new therapy for the prevention, detection, or treatment of one of the listed tropical diseases. You must then submit a marketing application um, under 505B1 for an NDA for a drug or 351 for a biologic. You must also request or state why your drug is eligible to receive a priority review voucher in the marketing application. Next slide. Your drug or biologic must not contain an active ingredient that has been approved under other uh, 505B1s or 351As. Combination products are allowed, so for example, fixed-dose combinations, if the combination contains at least one new active moiety. Um, the drug itself must be eligible for the priority review program. Um, in, in brief, uh, priority review program is for serious diseases. Um, that uh, a drug provides significant improvement in safety and effectiveness. This uh, discussion of a priority review is subject of other uh, fierce presentations as well as uh, guidance from FDA in 2014. Next slide. It's important to note that the priority review voucher is granted at the time of a marketing application. So it is possible that when you um, apply or complete your marketing application, you would be eligible for priority review voucher, but at the time your marketing application is approved, you would no longer be um, applicable. And so in this case, no voucher would be granted. Next slide. To date, there have been four tropical disease vouchers granted since 2007. Um, the first three are drugs to treat malaria, tuberculosis, and leishmaniasis, and most recently, in 2016, a vaccine to treat cholera. Next slide. That we know of to date, two of the vouchers have been used for marketing applications and two still remain unused. Um, it is important to note that redemption of the voucher does not equal approval. Um, for example, one of the tropical review priority vouchers was used on a product that was not ultimately granted approval. Your data must still support, support approval of your drug. And so in this case, um, the voucher was not utilized to its full extent. Next slide. There have been additions to the Tropical Priority Review Voucher System, and for that, I will turn over to Shayla. Thank you, Kelly. 
Next slide, please. So in 2014, um, there were some discussions about how can we improve this, um, the priority uh, review voucher for tropical diseases. And it, it was actually raised because of the West Africa Ebola outbreak that started around December 2013, but it expanded to the majority of 2014. So um, there was a need to create a, a new bill to include the Ebola viruses into the qualifying diseases. So that's exactly what happened. It was signed into law um, in December 2014, and the ad was called Adding the Ebola to the FDA Priority Review Voucher Program Act. So the act um, added all the family of phyloviruses that include uh, five Ebola viruses, two strains of Marburg virus, and one strain of the Cueva virus. There were other notable important changes that were made to the law, and I will explain those a little bit in detail in the next few slides to improve the process. But interestingly, um, as, um, early this year, um, due to the Zika virus outbreak, the Zika virus disease was added to the qualifying diseases as well. And in, 2000, in April also, there, were, there was a um, technical modification to change from phyloviruses to phylovirus diseases because the disease is what qualifies and not the virus. So in October this year, the FDA guidance was updated to reflect these changes, and we're going to leave um, a link for uh, your review um, if you desire. Next slide, please. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the additional changes to the law in addition to adding Ebola. And the first one was that now in order to redeem the prior review voucher, um, the company who holds the voucher has to notify the FDA in 90 days. And previously, a company needed to give the FDA an entire year before um, sending the marketing application. So um, it was very difficult for companies to predict w the exact day when they're going to submit the application because most companies will wait for um, results from late phase um, clinical trials. So this was a, a, a great improvement to the law. The second one was that now the voucher allows, uh, the, vou the, the law allows the voucher to be transferred on limited number of times. And previously there was only one um, transaction that was allowed, and this was a little bit risky for some companies because if your business needs or um, there were some changes in your clinical program and you couldn't use the voucher, that was a, a risk um, for, for you as a company. So now um, you can obtain the voucher and you can resell it um, anytime. Next slide, please. The last but not least um, change to the law, it now allows the FDA to add any new infectious diseases to the list of tropical diseases that are eligible for a voucher by order instead of by regulation. And this um, will actually prevent the lengthy notice and common provisions when there's uh, changes in regulation. And um, as as part of the Ebola outbreak that it took so long, almost an entire year for this to be added, there was a need to change the process on how this is, can be added. So in um, August 2015, the FDA exercised its new authority and now added two new uh, diseases to the qualifying list. And this is the Chagas disease and the neurosis cercosis disease. Importantly, um, for the FDA to add any new diseases, um, it has to be an infectious disease that is n where there's no significant market in developed nations, and it has to disproportionately affect poor or marginalized populations. Um, next slide, please. And now we're going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to uh, leave Devin to talk about more in detail about the rare pediatric disease 
priority voucher. Thanks. Next slide, please. So a number of these modifications to the voucher program that Shayla just discussed actually came about as a result of the introduction of the Rare Pediatric Disease Priority Review Voucher Program, which was added in 2012 through FIDESIA. So this program was originally introduced as a pilot study, essentially, of some of these um, uh, new applications to the voucher program, as well as introducing rare pediatric disease as a qualifying feature. And so this program originally included a sunset provision. And what that entailed was that uh, one year after the third voucher was awarded, then the program would sunset. And so one year after that third voucher was awarded, the program would close and allow for a period of evaluation of the success of the program and uh, some of the modifications it introduced. So that third voucher was awarded in March of 2015, and so that original sunset, sunset date was set for March of 2016. That has since been extended a number of times. As of yesterday, uh, when we put these slides together, it was uh, December 31st of this year was the new sunset date. However, there's currently legislation working its way first through the House and just yesterday passed the Senate as well that would extend this program through 2020. Um, as a, a note along those lines, there's actually an interesting piece within this legislation that the program itself is extended through 2020. However, we'll get into some discussion of the qualifications for the Rare Pediatric Disease Program in a moment, but uh, drugs that qualify as drugs treating rare pediatric diseases, they only need to qualify by 2020. They can actually receive a voucher up until 2022. Next slide, please. So there's three main qualifications that a therapy needs to qualify for in order to uh, be assigned as treating a rare pediatric disease. This is that it needs to target a pediatric population, it needs to target a disease that's serious or life-threatening, and the disease needs to be rare. Next slide. To go into a little bit more detail about these, as for a pediatric population, what defines this is that less than, or I'm sorry, greater than 50% of the affected U.S. population is between zero and 18 years old. As for serious or life-threatening, this uses the same definitions as what you'll find in fast-track designation or breakthrough therapy designation of being a serious or life-threatening disease. Next slide. And for defining it as a rare disease, this is again the same definition in this case as in the Orphan Drug Act, meaning that the disease itself either affects less than 200,000 people currently living in the U.S. or affects an orphan subset, a clearly scientifically defined orphan subset of a more prevalent disease or alternatively affects more than 200,000 people, but there's no reasonable expectation that the development costs for developing a therapy against this disease could be recouped through U.S. sales. Next slide. So in order to get your uh, drug designated as a drug to treat a rare pediatric disease, you need to submit a rare pediatric disease designation request. And so this is strongly encouraged to be submitted at the same time as either an orphan drug designation or a fast-track designation request. However, it's not absolutely mandated that this be the case. This designation request just needs to be submitted prior to NDA or BLA submission. Next slide. After submitting this request, FDA will issue a decision within 60 days. However, and this is an important caveat, this does not apply if this request is not submitted alongside an orphan drug or fast-track designation request. So again, while it's not required that they be submitted concurrently, you do lose this uh, requirement on FDA to issue a decision within a fixed time frame. There's three potential responses you can get for this request. The disease can be designated as a rare pediatric disease. Um, FDA cannot actually bless your application as being a rare pediatric disease product application until they actually view the materials as part of your submission, but they can grant a conditional approval at this stage. So you can go into your NDA or BLA application with confidence that should nothing change, it should still carry that uh, designation. Lastly, if neither of these two happens, you can receive a deficiency letter which will explain which criteria your drug or your program was not eligible for and can allow you to go and either modify your program or just understand why it doesn't qualify as a rare pediatric disease program. Next slide. So taking a look at the voucher program itself, there have been seven rare pediatric disease vouchers granted since the program's inception in 2014. Next slide. The utilization of these to date, three remain unused. 
Three of these have been sold between companies and were included in that previous slide showing sale prices. And one actually had an agreement negotiated ahead of time whereby the company that was awarded the voucher transferred it to another company based on that prior agreement. Next slide. As for redemption status, two of these vouchers have been redeemed and have a little interesting story around each of them. One of the sold vouchers was used to successfully speed the approval of Praluent, which is a drug treating high cholesterol. And the interesting piece of this story is that uh, this drug is uh, a product of a Sanofi and Regeneron collaboration. They were in a race with Amgen to get very similar products to the market. Amgen actually beat Sanofi and Regeneron to the market in Europe. However, by virtue of using this priority review voucher in the U.S., Sanofi and Regeneron were able to get to the market one or two months quicker here. Uh, so there's a direct benefit to the investment that so uh, Sanofi and Regeneron made in that voucher as manifested by this quicker time to market and first to market status. One other of these sold vouchers was used successfully, and I say this in quotes, for uh, another one of Sanofi's products. Um, it was used successfully in the sense that this product was ultimately approved. However, as we discussed earlier, that's not a consequence of the voucher itself. Successfully is in quotes here because Sanofi was in a race with another company, Novo Nordisk here, and both of their products actually ended up getting approved on the exact same date. Um, there was some discussion along the way of Sanofi was request, uh, FDA requested some additional information from Sanofi, so their priority review time ended up getting pushed back as a result of that request. Um, and so ultimately there was no competitive advantage gained from the use of this voucher, uh, although the product was ultimately successfully approved. Next slide. So to go into a little bit more detail about how to actually use these vouchers, I'll hand this back over to Kelly once again. Thank you, Devin. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. So in this case, we are shifting from obtaining the priority review voucher to actually using the priority review voucher. Um, the sponsor that received the voucher may choose to transfer or sell the voucher to another sponsor or may choose to use it themselves. Um, the application, marketing application using the voucher must also be submitted under 505B1 for an NDA or 351 for a biologic. Next slide. You must notify FDA of the intent to use the voucher at least 90 days in advance of the NDA or BLA application. And it is generally a good idea to discuss that you may use the application with FDA at your pre-NDA or BLA meeting if the timing is appropriate. You must pay the priority review voucher user fee. This is a fee implemented by FDA in 2011 um, to help recoup some of the cost to FDA of, uh, of simplifying and, and squeezing into a tighter time the review of the application. So in 2017, this fee will be around $2.7 million, which is actually a $21,000 reduction in uh, over 2016 fee. So at the time of the marketing application, you have the potential to pay a PDUFA fee of a little over $2 million, plus the voucher fee of around $2.7 million, so in total about $4.7 million. Next slide. There have been challenges and limitations associated with a priority review voucher program. For example, uh, the timing of receiving this incentive you do not receive this voucher until your marketing application, NDA or BLA, is actually approved, whereas other incentives um, from FDA can be received throughout development of the drug. As we just discussed, there is a cost associated with using the voucher in the form of the voucher fee. Some products are not included in the priority review voucher program, including devices, blood components, and certain other biological products, such as allergens. Um, potentially, the program does not lead to innovation. Um, for example, drugs already approved outside of the U.S. 
can receive the priority review voucher if a marketing application um, is new to the U.S. And so in this case, you would still receive the voucher, but the innovation is, is less or is not there. From a patient perspective, um, just because a new therapy is uh, on the market does not necessarily change that the patient will have access to this drug or necessarily increase the affordability of this drug. There is uncertainty around the future of the voucher program. Next slide, please. Some members of FDA, as well as others in industry, um, have voiced concerns about the effectiveness of its program, and some don't support continuation. The program has the potential to strain agency resources in that the agency must focus on a six-month review. And it, additionally, um, it could force FDA to potentially focus on less beneficial or less impactful approvals of drugs from a public health perspective. However, as we just discussed, there is new legislation proposed to reauthorize the programs, as well as potentially add new vouchers, neonatal medical countermeasures, as well as some generics. Next slide. I will turn this over to Shayla for conclusions, as well as questions. Next slide, please. So to summarize the priority review voucher program, it's basically a win-win situation. Uh, one la the previous slide, please. Um, it's a win-win situation for society. Uh, basically uh, benefits not only patients that um, live in poor marginalized populations or patients that are suffering rare diseases, but also um, fits an unmet medical need and, in addition, incentivize innovations. So sponsors and potential companies can benefit from this program. Um, if you are a company who is uh, making a product for a tropical or very pediatric disease, you have the opportunity to either use, or use it for your next product and you have the potential to get, up, get it approved faster. Um, or you have the option to sell it, and then you will get more resources for your next drug or biologic program. And um, if you're an innovator for a new drug or a new biologic product that does not necessarily qualify for a tropical or a rare pediatric disease, you can also benefit from the program by buying the voucher, and you can either use it and increase your marketing time, exposure to market, and sales, or you have the option to sell it if you feel that your business needs change. So it's a, it's a great um, program, and it's good to have um, some knowledge about it. And with that, we'll thank you for your attention, and we'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, Sheila. Now let's move on to the Q&A. There's still some time to submit your questions using the Q&A button in the lower left corner of your screen. We've had a lot of great questions so far, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. The first question, can an application receive a rare pediatric disease PRV if the application includes adult population in addition to the pediatric population? Yes. So the uh, short answer is yes, but um, it has to be that the adult population has to have the same um, indication and the same rare disease as the pediatric population, and they both have to be in the same marketing application. It will not apply um, if you have um, another indication where there's only an adult population. So the important thing here is that you can have adults and pediatrics in the same application, and of course, um, the FDA has the option to um, just approve for adult population and not for the pediatric, and then you're not going to uh, qualify for the priority review voucher program. So it's important that along with your application you have enough data for both then adult and pediatric population. Thank you. Our next question. How do you notify the FDA of your intent to use a PRV? So uh, you need to uh, notify FDA w at least 90 days in advance um, of your intent to use the voucher. 
And this notification must include the exact date that you're planning to submit the marketing application. And importantly, this can be requested either as an IND amendment submission, or ideally, it can be part of your pre-NDA or BLA meeting request, and this will be also a formal notification. And usually, that's the timing that you will have a request at least three months in advance. Thank you. Our next question. For tropical diseases prevalent elsewhere but rare in the United States, does the voucher fee still apply? Yes. So the, the, um, there are no waivers for the priority review voucher fee for both either the product, uh, tropical disease or for the rare pediatric disease voucher. However, if you are a company who receives the voucher and you're planning to use it, um, and if you have an orphan designation or have any other qualifications that allow you to have a waiver, the PEDUFA fee will be waived, but not the priority review voucher fee waived. So no waivers for the priority review voucher. Thank you. Our next question. The program for the Rare Pediatric Priority Review Voucher has only been extended by President Obama until the end of this year. What will happen after the companies developing, excuse me, companies developing a therapy, a therapy for a rare pediatric disease in order to get the voucher? We, we already received a designation for rare pediatric, but our drug is still under development and will not apply for market approval in a few, until a few years later. Right, so actually, as of just yesterday, this uh, updated measure has passed the Senate in the U.S., so at this point is just waiting for the President's signature in order to be moved into law. This would extend the program through 2020, so um, there's plenty of time to then still get your marketing application in and receive a voucher. And as a note, um, a comment I made earlier about this, actually this program gets extended through 2020. That 2020 date is the point by which, at least for rare pediatric diseases, you would need to get that rare pediatric disease designation by. You would then have a two-year period after that to submit your marketing application and still qualify for a voucher if that application is successful. So fortunately, if this legislation ultimately moves through, it will extend this program for a significant period of time. Thank you. Our next question. How, how do you communicate or request the FDA to add a new tropical disease to, to the qualifying list? So the FDA has established a public docket that it's now available through which interested um, companies or single people can um, request um, additional diseases to be added to the list. So the request important has to include information to um, document that the disease meets the criteria set forth in the Act, and the FDA is, uh, will periodically review the request, and they um, they have the authority to expand the list. So it's um, you can even see the comments that have been submitted by other people, other companies um, publicly. Um, so it's uh, it's a way for the public to be involved and, and suggest new diseases to be included. Thank you. Our next question, when do you pay the voucher fee? The voucher fee is paid at the time of the marketing application. Thanks. Our next question, can an application receive a rare pediatric – oh, we already asked that one. I'm sorry. Here's the next question. How much are the vouchers changing hands for? So if you're asking how much you're changing hands for, I'm assuming you're talking about price here, and uh, that's actually been an increasing number, at least as far as what's been publicly disclosed. So the original one sold for around 60 or 70 million, and the most recently published sale price was for right around 350 million, and it's been an increasing stepwise process getting up there. There have been a couple that have been sold that there haven't been um, prices publicly available for. So. Uh, there, it's not certain what's going on in that sort of market, but as far as what's out there, $350 million was the most recent price. Thank you. That was our final question. 
Thank you for attending this Fierce Live webinar and submitting so many great questions. I'd like to thank our speakers for participating and Roe for presenting today's webinar. This webinar has been recorded. You'll be able to access the recording within 24 hours on the same page you used to register for the event. Thank you again for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.